Episode 158 of the 4x4 podcast is brought to you by Artemis Overland Hardware. Artemis Overland Hardware is a family business with a huge selection of Overland equipment in stock for online orders, or you can visit the showroom located in Springfield, Missouri. Either way, Artemis Overland Hardware will get you equipped and ready for all your adventures, wherever they may take you. You're listening to the 4x4 Podcast, the podcast all about four-wheeling, overlanding, off-road racing, and the outdoor lifestyle. We talk about news, tips and tricks, answer your questions, and interview big and little names in the off-roading world. So whether your rig is busted and you're in the shop wrenching on it, or you're on your way to the trail, join us and we'll keep you plugged in on topics to help you get away. Here are your hosts, Dan, Craig, and Rich. And thanks for coming back for another episode of the 4x4 Podcast. I am Dan, uh, you're one of the hosts here, and, and Craig, how you doing there? I'm doing all right, hanging in there, just getting through life at this point. Yeah. You know? And Rich, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, keeping busy, getting houses ready to be bought and sold, and shopping for RVs and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, once all that's done, you'll be able to uh, get back to the adventures. Um, but uh, today we have a really exciting interview uh, for for those that are not familiar with manual transmissions and clutches and everything like that. This is going to be a really educational one. Uh, Will, who has been working with Center Force clutches for an extremely long time, it was a really great conversation. And since I am of the you know save the manuals uh, camp. This is a fun one. So uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to that interview with Will from Center Force Clutches. Today on the podcast, I'm really excited. We have Will from Center Force Clutches. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank Outstanding. You. Well, thanks for coming on. Um, I am in the camp of, you know, God save the manuals. I, I've been driving a manual transmission like we were talking about uh, for over 20 years or about 20 years, I guess. Uh, and, and that is my preference. Um, but I know not everybody fits into that. So, uh, in our conversation, I, I think we'll figure out a little bit about why, uh, I guess one, how a manual transmission of the clutch works. Cause that may be a mystery to some, but, um, before we get into all of that, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and kind of how you fit into the automotive world? What's your background? Sure, sure. Um, obviously, I've been I've been doing working for Center Force here for my second time around now for 31 years. I just had my 31 year anniversary. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, but I started, uh, you know, way back in the day, and you know, I grew up in California, Lakewood, and uh, my dad was a, uh, you know, an old street racer back in the day. So you know, he used to race his 50 Merc and some 34 Fords, you know, so I, I grew up in the old cars and I really got hooked on it. And, uh, so I absolutely loved old cars. And then my buddy who lived in the same track as I did, his dad was also in the car. So him and I just clicked and both of our dads were machinists by trade. Um, so, you know, for him and I to start doing that, uh, being a machinist and getting in the cars, which is, it was just natural. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm a kid and I'm playing with everything that has a motor lawn, lawn mowers. And I remember <laughs> I'd bought a, uh, one of those little Honda sprees of 50 CC and, uh, I wanted to make it faster. And cause we always had our competition and, uh, I was doing stuff and my dad had messed around with the model airplanes and that, that model airplane fuel had nitromethane in it. Yeah. I started putting that into my Honda spree. And, uh, <laughs> It worked. Uh, once once things got the temperature where it would actually fire the nitro, that thing would actually, uh, you know, in the factory was 34 miles an hour. I got it up to 50 to 59 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, a lot of things to it, but uh, when I put the fuel into the to the edger that one time, my dad come out and dragged me out and he said, "What the hell? Is going on with this I can't shut this stupid thing off." You know, he put the nitro nitro fuel in the yeah edger but uh no that's i mean i've always been around cars like i said the the old cars and then uh that was just always my passion and my first car was a uh, 1954 ford mainline business coupe wow and uh, and i had built that up and I, I absolutely did not want that car but my mom 
uh, what I wanted was a 55 Chevy, still to this day one of my favorite cars. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there was one with a 327 and a four-speed, and she knew that, you know, I had the bug. I wanted, I wanted to go fast, and uh, we had a – my dad and I built the Model A up that had a, a 550-horse small block Chevy in it, and that thing would actually carry the front tires oh, across yes. the end. Well, that's, that's how I grew up uh, was that. So when this 55 Chevy came up, I was like, all right, cool, I'm going to get that. And my mom said, nope, nope, you're going to get the sky blue 54 Ford. That was just uh, – just got awful at the time. And uh, I think I had it a week in it at this the little 223 uh, in it, that straight six of junk timing. And uh, so we had to put an engine in it, and that's what I did. I put a 390. I was at that time back then we could, you know, auto shop was something we had. You had we had uh, metal shop, welding, drafting, yeah. and I also did. I was in the auto shop as well, so I built a 390 for that thing and stuffed it in there and. Uh, that was really pretty cool. I, I turned this goofy looking blue 54 Ford mainline business coupe that didn't have a back seat. Yeah. Back then, we used to go to Highway 39, the drive in theater uh, in uh, California. And so I I was into Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and all that other stuff. Sure. So, so the car was uh, didn't have that back seat. So I, I put 412s into the back. <laughs> And use the trunk as the box, and that thing would just boom. So, so <laughs> my dad would hear me coming long before I even got. Oh yeah. Got, but uh, yeah, I ended up racing that thing, crashed that, and uh, then I moved on to a '65 Mustang and uh, drag raced that for a little while. Sure. And actually, a lot of street racing out. You know, something you don't do nowadays, but uh, back then, Terminal Island is where we raced. We raced. Uh, in Balboa, and there was a few other industrial places we would go. And uh, back then, was that was the thing to do, and it was uh, obviously not something to do nowadays. And I don't like to, you know, yeah. promote it. Well, you Especially. know, I go back and forth. Like, I mean, that Ford Mainline, it's a good looking car. Uh, maybe it wasn't the 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 '55 Chevy that you wanted, but it's still a great looking car. Uh, I don't know if the cars now are going faster. Uh, I feel like it's a little easier to get into a car that's going faster now. Uh, uh, technology's changed drastically. Yeah. Uh, that car ran good, but it was never, I mean, we've got a, uh, you know, here a Camaro that, that we run, uh, you know, it's a fifth gen Camaro. It's 800 horse, but it's scary fast. You yeah. know, it's, uh, that 50, that 54 Ford I had, uh, had a, 390 was, you know, basically it wasn't nothing crazy, but it had a nice little cam because I always liked the rumpity rump. Um, and, it, you know, it, its bark was way worse than its bite. It sure. Was, um, you know, it wasn't going to do anything crazy, but uh, it, it sure sounded like it would. Yeah. Well, as we, you know, kind of move towards the newer vehicles like you were talking about, it, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, a vehicle that has a, a manual transmission. I think we were just talking on the podcast a few episodes ago that, you know, the full-size trucks, uh, it's it's even more difficult to, to find a manual Can't transmission get, on them. Yeah, no Can't longer offered. Them. Yeah, but that's kind of isolated here to the, the North American market. I think in the European market and a lot of the other – uh, foreign areas like the manual transmission is still the standard uh, getting yeah, an automatic that's is is a luxury quite the opposite it, it's it's the switch when you go european yep just about everything is standard transmission i mean even you go to mexico um you know that same way everything's all their buses everything is a manual transmission we're out here um no yeah well why do you think that is why why have the U S market kind of trended towards an automatic and, uh, foreign markets are still primarily manuals. You know, I, everyone has their own guess. I, you know, I don't know if it's laziness or just the uh, technology itself in the automatic world is in, in the United States. There's some smart people out here, you know, like, you know, we, I have a lot of friends that, that they're, you know, they work in the automatic world and, uh, you know the technology is completely different than what it used to be. Yeah. Uh, you know the old, you know the Turbo 350 or Turbo 400, which back then it was, you know, you'd want to get away from them because basically it's just a big oil pump and it, <laughs> it 
could fly up to power. Yep. Nowadays, you know, you get your 10 speeds and 8 speed transmissions, and, and they actually run pretty good. But, you know, for the guy that likes to actually roll, roll through the gears, you know, wants to hear it, you, there's still that, that element out there that people like to do that. Oh, yeah. uh, but like I said the, the automatic transmission is not the same thing as it used to be. They're actually, they run pretty good. But, you know, for a guy that likes to, to still roll through the gears, uh, and like to hear that car run, you know, it's long, run, yep. you know, there's nothing, you know, it puts a smile on your face. And that's one thing, you know, like an automatic, it, you get a fast car and it feels good. But when you have a car, when you're actually shifting it, you almost feel part of that car. Yeah. You know, you get a smile on your face, you know, cause you're, you're driving that car and you're, you know, you're pulling the next gear and you're hearing it run through its RPM spectrum. And then, bro, 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 you know, and it's yep. it's just a lot of fun, and it, it, you become one with that car. And like I said, it's that you, know, you you get a smile on your face. You see somebody that that just ran a car, you know, and, and just you know kind of rode through the gears. They got a smile on their face. You oh, see yeah. someone else in an automatic. It's it's not the same. It's not the same feeling, and it's not that the automatic is bad. It's just until you've actually been in a, a car where you're rolling through the gears. And yep. feeling it, right? and you because you really feel the power. Every yep. gear, you you roll into it, and you feel the car twist up, and you know, and, 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 and you know, you, you just you just feel that sensation of being sucked in the seat, in and out, and sucked back in the seat, you know, and it's yeah, neat, and and to, to hear it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, I I love being able to shift my own gears. Having a five speed in in my Jeep Cherokee is kind of rare, uh, but like I said, I. I bought that Jeep in 2004, and I haven't had to deal with the clutch at all. Uh, but when I bought it, the guy provided me a giant box of receipts, and in one of the receipts was a center force clutch. Uh, so uh -huh. they, they had put that in there. But that was in 2004, so I don't know how long it was in before that. Obviously not any older than 99, but it's been yeah. flawless. I haven't had any issues with it ever since. Um, We've got guys in the off-road world, uh, even the editors, that have put their clutches you know, put clutches in, you know, in the eighties and that same clutch is still in there. <laughs> and these guys, they're, you know, they, they get parts pretty readily, you know, yeah, easily. And, uh, but yeah, the guys like, yeah, hey, still running the same clutch you guys sent me, you know, 20 something years ago. I'm like, Are you seriously? <laughs> yeah, it's still in there. Okay. Still do it. Still working. Okay. No issues. Uh, well, let's uh, start to transition here and talk about, uh, I guess maybe we should have some background because I know a large portion of the audience doesn't necessarily know how a manual transmission, that really the clutch part portion of it, actually functions. Can you kind of walk us through uh, some of that? And I know I'll, I'll kind of get ahead of you. On the website at centerforce.com, you actually have the Center Force University, uh, which has a bunch of videos that do a great job of explaining it with the visual and everything. So, uh, Oh, thank you. Yeah, those are great. And I realize as I click play, that's you on there that we're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so can you walk me through how that clutch works? Sure. So, you know, obviously you have your, your power plant, which is your engine. You have your your transmission, dry shaft, and rear end. And what, and what the clutch is, it's basically a coupler. And it it's it's basically allowing the power that the engine develops and it transfers it to the transmission and then so on to the dry shaft and then to whatever, if it's a four-wheel drive, it's both differentials to the transfer case, the differential. So it's basically, it's a coupler. And so it's, it's your device for holding the, whatever power that engine is developing. Or, and basically when we talk power, we actually like talk torque uh, because that's the real number yep. uh, for us that we're looking to hold. And so that's all it's doing. And so, so you're engaging and disengaging that power trend, that plow, power plant uh, to the transmission to the next link down the line. And, you know, you can either have very aggressive friction material or a very stiff clutch, uh, which makes it a little harder to control. Or you can have like what we have uh, with our ball bearing technology, you know, very soft clutch that has a lot of holding capacity. So then the when you go to let the clutch out it's very easy it's it's what we call modulation and it's modulating the clutch so when when you start to let the clutch out the car doesn't just necessarily grab and go just jerk and go you can actually feel it and kind of feather it and you can drive it very easily so you don't get that jerky motion 
And that's what I'm talking about. It's just a coupler. It's just all it does is hold the power. Sure. Yeah, I was talking to my my kids. We watch uh, the Roadkill show on Motor Trend on demand. Uh, yeah, and those watching, guys are, yeah, those guys are a riot. Um, but they were asking about what do they mean when they say dump the clutch. And I said, well, explain it to them, and then they watch what happens. Said, okay, that's that's kind of why you don't necessarily want to do that. <laughs> kind of yeah. talk them through it. But every time we go off roading, they're always asking about how what does that extra stick do? Because mommy's truck doesn't have that. <laughs> Oh, the transfer case? It, well, the the transmission. Uh, you know, oh, transmission. she's yeah. my wife's got a 2017 Ram 1500 that's got the oh. big fancy eight speed automatic in there mm-hmm. uh, with the rotary dial on the the shifter. Oh. You know, like it looks completely different than the five speed manual that's in in my Jeep. So, uh, but it, for sure, it, there's a big difference in a lot of vehicles. I've driven a bunch of different ones, and each clutch has a very different feel. And where it really is going to grab is always different. And so being able to modulate uh, the pedal and kind of figure out where it's really going to grab and where you get uh, the full torque of the engine going through the transmission is, is always kind of different. Um, is, is there some benefits to to how hard it is to, to push in the pedal, the, the clutch pedal, or is that all personal preference? Well, it, you know, it really depends. You know, um, I tell people every time you push that clutch pedal in, you're trying to push the crank out of the front of the block um, because that's exactly what you're doing. All that force uh, that the pedal effort has is actually trying to push the crank out of the front because that's, that, that's that thrust bearing. So when you get a clutch that's extremely stiff, um, you know, some of these aftermarket clutches, uh, they, there's two ways to achieve clamp load, and that's one through the pivot point and the other is through the diaphragm. Uh, we keep more of a stockish type diaphragm so we can keep that soft user control feel and in ball bearing. So, yeah, there there is a difference in pedal efforts, friction material, but more than anything, the weight of the overall assembly, meaning like the flywheel. Um, you know, like in the off-road community, um, we run a heavier flywheel uh, just because inertia is your friend. And when you're off-roading, that's what you're wanting is you wanting to be able to you're operating at a lower rpm at a lower speed yep so so we want that torque there we don't want the weight of the vehicle to pull the engine down as easily and stall it that's what happens so you let the clutch out that you know the, the the vehicle can stall so when we put a lot of mass on the back of the flywheel you know our high inertia flywheels you can actually let that clutch out and the the vehicle will sit there and crawl and hit obstacles, you know, whether going it's going through, you know, a rut or hitting a boulder or something like that. And, and you can almost just let it work and just steer, you know, yep. without having to feather the clutch or get on a rock and, and then, you know, start to roll back and then you let the clutch out too fast and now you jerk forward. Um, and that's all about user control. And then, like I said, that modulation, being able to feel that clutch when it's going to come in. But the heavier flywheel is a is a huge benefit in off roading. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the way to visualize that is when you see the new driver trying to learn a clutch and they're on a hill, and they're yeah. revving it up just because they're trying to figure out, you know, where they can l- allow that clutch to slip out and catch. Mm-hmm. It's it's probably a lot easier with that heavier flywheel, is what you're saying. It's a lot easier. So so and then, you know like when you you go let the clutch out and the car starts jerking. That's because you're, you kind of get panicked, you know, especially on a hill. Anytime somebody gets on the hill, they panic a little bit. I don't want to roll back. And, you know, then you don't, you know, you end up slipping the clutch a lot trying to get the car going, going because you don't want to break the tires loose or, you know, be herky jerky when you take off yep. that high inertia steel flywheel. That just calms everything down. And it makes it just, it's just a simple, let the clutch out and, and give her some throttle. And it's just, it's effortless. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it just makes driving and driver control so much better than, than what it was, you know, with the factory. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so we mm-hmm. talked about some of the components that are inside that clutch, uh, the flywheel, and then I guess the, the clutch material, but there's more components to it. No, you have sprung, springs inside of that, which are adapting, and, and the, that's in the disc itself. So you have your flywheel that's bolted to the crank or the engine. That's spinning at all. Every every 
RPM the spin the engine's doing, that flywheel's doing that as well. And then bolted to that is a pressure plate, and that's where the clamp load comes in. So in between the pressure plate and the flywheel is the clutch disc itself, and that's where the input shaft. You'll notice that there's uh, serrations or you know what we call those splined area of that disc, and that's where the different materials, whether it be organic or ceramic. Uh, come into play and, and obviously there's thousands of different organic and, and same as the serum metallic materials so that you can try your holding capacity and driver control but inside of there are springs and that's your dampening and having the proper spring for what you're doing is critical for for whatever you're doing as far as applications whether it be just daily driving off-roading or you know a spirited type of heavy street driving or drag racing or just full out off-road competition. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we tailor those springs for that application because we don't want it to be too soft so that that in that disc itself, there's actually two, two components. Uh, you know, the springs, there's three actually. The inside spline area that, that's uh, driven by uh, off of the, the transmission itself, well, that actually compresses those springs. Just like you know, just like a vehicle, the springs on the car, it's yeah. they they compress. Well, that's what happens inside of that disc too. So when they're too soft, it'll come over and it'll hit that positive stop too fast, and you end up beating the disc apart uh, if it's not sprung properly. You know, it's just like you know, a car that's that's real bouncy. Well, you don't want that. You want it to be to take that bump and come right back. Well, right. that same thing, same kind of concept in the disc itself. We don't want it too stiff so that it's you know, rigid and it, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And that's dampen uh, all the harmonics that the engine's developing. So as you know, when an engine's running, you know, obviously it makes noise. Well, it also develops a lot of harmonics and um, harmonics can do some really funny things. Uh, as, yeah, you ain't kidding. <laughs> like weird stuff that you wouldn't even imagine uh, it can all be I mean, caused by the it, harmonics. Yeah, I mean, if you look at like uh, you know a car with a big heavy base, and you can you can feel it, you know that boom, that that the uh, percussion. Well, the, that same type of uh, aspect is happening inside that bell housing, especially when you have a bell housing, you know, aluminum bell housing or steel bell housing. The steel bell housing, that's just a big megaphone. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, it's like a trombone. So everything coming out of it. So when you develop more harmonics and noises inside of it it amplifies and it, it makes things flutter. So we got to be very careful about materials that we don't want to be too thin, you know, in our competition uh, series, you know, of all of our dyads and our triple disc for the race cars. We don't want to be so thin that, that cause you know, these guys are buzzing at seven, 8,000 RPM. And you can imagine what's happening inside of that bell house and what things are doing at that RPM. And, so when, when you push your clutch and we need it to react the way it's supposed to react, not kind of flutter, because that's what's happening all those harmonics that are happening. And those are the types of things that we're trying to to deal with and trying to to co conquer in a way to make sure that the clutch does what it's supposed to do every time you push your clutch, clutch pedal down. Got it. Well, uh, okay, let's transition here and start talking about uh, what all you guys have in the catalog and, and how it all is set up. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in that catalog. Yeah. I mean, you're supporting a wide, wide range of vehicles here. Uh, and I imagine there's a lot of customization, like we were talking about. You've got components that didn't start with no vehicle getting slapped in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, got to remember, we've been doing this for years. I mean, to give a backup and a little background of the company, you heard of Hayes Clutches before, right? I have, yeah. Well, that was actually started. We started off as Hayes. Huh. No way. So Bill Hayes, founder of Hayes Clutches, back in, you know, the 50s, working with, you know, in the drag race community at that time, Don Perdome, um, you know, Big Daddy and all those other guys, you know, he's working with them. Um, he had that Hayes name and he just, just it grew and grew. And, and quite honestly, Clutches was his side gig. He uh, hmm. was a full-time fireman. And Garden Grove. So, you know, they were 24 on, 24 off. So in his off time, he he was just a genius of a man. And uh, 
he uh, he needed something to do with his time, so he started messing around with clutches, and we did that for quite some time. Was very successful with it. The name grew and grew and grew, and uh, an investment company said, "Hey, we're going to offer you X amount of dollars for your name," and uh, the figure was was nice. So he sold the name. And at that point in time, in the early 80s, late or late 70s, early 80s, is when the diaphragm clutch came out. Because when Bill was doing that, Hayes clutches, that was all the lever style. Uh, and what happened is the the, clutch, the diaphragm would stick over center. It had an inherent problem of sticking over center. And uh, Bill said, you know what, I got to... I've got a way to, I think, can fix that. And that was when he came up with the strip, our centrifugal weights that you see on the diaphragm. Those were originally put on there to help combat the diaphragm from sticking over center. So when you push the clutch down, the diaphragm would go down and it would stay down. And then at about three or 4,000 RPM, it popped back. That was the common problem with the diaphragm clutch back in the day. Hmm. It also added centrifugal assist, which added more clamping force. So as RPM increased, it actually gave it more clamping hold, uh, clamping force. So the holding capacity increased with RPM. And in that, after he designed all that and made all that, they actually started center force clutches back in 1982. So that's, we're looking at, you know, 38 years now, center force clutches has been around, but it actually started, you know, well before that with Hayes clutch. And that's who, my mentor, I worked with Bill Hayes, and there's another gentleman, a couple guys here that still work here uh, that work with Bill, and that's where I got my knowledge from, was Bill Hayes. How about that? Yeah. That's fascinating. So, yeah, I mean, you think about it, it's like, well, okay, who's Bill Hayes? And then you say, oh, Hayes Clutches. Oh, Hayes Clutches? Wow. Yeah. Well, now they're, you know, Mr. Gasket had bought them and, and went for a long run with them, and then uh, I think uh, I think Holly owns it now, but almost everything else but <laughs> yeah i think they own uh Hayes clutches now well all right all right so is it as simple as just kind of going to the website punching in the vehicle that you need to find exactly uh what it is you're looking for or? that's the easiest way we um you know we stopped doing a paper catalog some time ago um but our website is probably um, you know, like to say the best place or your, your online catalog. Most people, that's what they do nowadays. They just, you know, when you're at work, yeah, for something, even though you're, you're supposed to be working. But uh, like, right, like the rest of us, you know, we we get sidetracked and looked at uh, different stuff. So, yep, uh, yeah. Facebook or uh, excuse me, uh, our website is a good place to find that application. If you cannot find it, just give us a call uh, because you know we're constantly coming up with new stuff and uh you know there's, there's different things there's about 2500 different applications that we have oh so wow when i said there's a lot there's yeah a lot. no that you're not kidding that's a lot um so, so we, i'm actually looking at the website right now when you go to products there's a little drop down that takes you to uh the the product series or product types uh can you explain the difference between what the series is versus a, a type so you have Select vehicle, and then you're going to pick whatever make it is. Uh, let's just say Jeep. And then you have uh, – well, I'm going to go straight to, to Wrangler. What what year are you on so I can uh, – So we can go ahead and do mine just for fun. I, I got a 99. It's the Jeep Cherokee. Yeah. So the 1999 uh, Jeep. Yep. Select mod model. Uh, you have the Wrangler or the Cherokee at that point. Yep, uh, Cherokee. And then, and then the submodel. It was it a limited, SE, sport, classic, and I know there's even more than that. Yeah, so. I, it, I think it's a sport. I never paid attention. I think the badges were rubbed off by a tree. <laughs> and then, then you go to sport and it says nothing. So that's actually uh, a fault in our website. Well, how about that? Either way, I think a classic does have something. I came across that one and they're all the, it's they're all the, the same. same. It's the same. I knew. I knew. About that. I mean, so if you hit a, if a ninety, I think your your range ninety seven to oh one. Yeah. Is this under yours? Yep. So if you hit limited, it'll come up and give you exactly. There's fourteen items, and it, it'll say the clutch disc, 
uh, the KCF, that's the kit. A K always is going to say kit. Okay. And the CF would would say the center force one. And then the center force one pressure plate would just be below that. And then another K CFT, now that's our center force two, which provides a little more holding capacity over the center force one. Center force one is the entry level, and that's what we would use for a vehicle with either very mild or no modifications done to it and pretty much just a daily driver. Sure. Uh, and then somebody looking for better than OE type material and something that's going to go in there. Like you said, we, we put this in, in vehicles and there's several of them that are, you know, 20 years down the road still working today. Uh, and then you, you know, but it, the driver has full control on how long that clutch is going to last. Yeah, those guys who dump the clutch every single time, they probably shorten up the lifespan considerably. Well, in the off-road world, yeah. Uh, yep. What do you do? First thing you do is you put a lift on it, you put wheels and tires. And what you've done at that point in time is change that overall gear ratio. Yep. Most, most guys, if it's if it came with like a 29-inch tall tire or 28-inch 20 inch tall tire, and they put 33s or 35s on it, 35 seems to be the norm nowadays. Um, you know, that gear ratio has changed, you know, that rear end gear. So now, and this is where that heavy flywheel would come into play to help, uh, is now when you go to take off in first gear, it almost is like you're taking off in second gear. Because yeah. now the weight, and you don't have that mechanical advantage, uh, you know, it's like riding a 10-speed bike, you know, taking off in, in a taller gear versus the very short gear. You know, what would normally be a little gear, now try to take off, and it's a lot harder. So, you know, it's just, you notice that uh, that type of stress, and the reason I'm going this down this and talking about it like this, is when you're in the smallest gear, you can kind of just take off, you're traveling real yep. fast, but you can move real easy. So as you start moving up, and you've got to take off from a dead stop, next thing you know, now you're you're standing up on the pedals to try to get get it going, and you're, you're working it. Well, that all that is doing is putting more stress on those parts, that chain, so to speak. Yep. Well, when you when you change that the the tires, you're putting that same same type of stress on all the drive line, transmission, sure. drive shaft, clutch, everything down the line. Even the rear end gears are, are seeing. Usually, usually the clutch and the drive shaft is what really sees the stress. Uh, obviously, axles as well. Yep. Um, so when you can put a lower gear set into it and put it closer back to stock, now all of a sudden you've lowered that gear ratio again. You've increased your mechanical advantage, and now the vehicle's moving a lot easier with less effort. Absolutely. And in you know, in, in the off-road world, all of us put winches. We start carrying more things, you know, and it's, yep. it's just. <clears throat> but what was a four thousand pound vehicle is now fifty five hundred pounds, and. <laughs> So, I mean, it, I did it myself, so I know. Yeah, it, we're all the same. So, yeah, I mean, but that's what we do. You know, I, you're not going to fault anybody. This is what we're doing. It's like, well, if you're going to do it, just prepare for it. Yep. You know, what are you going to do? You know, for every for every action, there's a reaction. So when you put bigger wheels and tires on it, uh, it affects the acceleration, but it also affects stopping so when you put big wheels and tires on it, your brakes are now pretty much inadequate for what yep. you're doing, especially when you've added weight to the vehicle. Just uh, challenging all the components and moving the weak link farther down the chain somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and it's, it's a vicious world because, you know, especially in the performance side, you know, the guys put more oh, and more yeah. power. And then they're slipping the clutch. Like, okay, well, now we put a bigger clutch in it or, you know, a better clutch in it. And all of a sudden they get used to that. And it's like, wow, the car doesn't feel fast anymore. Even though it's just as fast as it was, they've just grown accustomed to it. And now it feels slower. So then they start adding more power, put a bigger engine. Yep. Upwards, and that vicious cycle starts all over again because you're always chasing yep. the next weakest link. Um, well, that's and that's awesome. just fun. And we're going to continue to do that. I mean, I do it myself. I mean, I worked all day on my Jeep uh, because I was making some changes to it. Yep. Breaking parts, you know, that's just what we do. Yeah. Well, uh, so I guess to kind of bring us back around, what do you see as, like, the the deciding factor? Somebody's going to pick out a new vehicle. Maybe they're going to, 
you know, buy that new Jeep Gladiator, and they got to make a decision if they're going automatic or manual. Uh, what do you? What would you say to help them make that decision? Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm partial to a manual. Um, if you, mean, you know, driven in the off road like yourself, uh, I've driven both automatic and manual. I I obviously work for a clutch company, uh, but I'm always been partial to the manual uh, because I can do a lot more with it, uh, especially on deselling down a hill. Um, I can put it in that gear and it will hold that speed. You know, I'm going to come down a, a steep embankment and I know that that thing is not going to take off. You know, an automatic, they, they kind of free, free wheel, so to speak. And so the, now you're using your brakes to keep the vehicle from just kind of taking off. Sure. Or a manual transmission, you just pick that gear and you just let it let it come down on its own. All you're doing is steering. Um, you know, same thing for me is is crawling because usually you have a lower crawl ratio with a, a manual transmission. It's got a lower first gear, so we can we can do a lot more. And I can pick and choose what gear I want. So, yep. Uh, for myself, I like you know I like that. Um, and again, it's rolling through the gears. You know, it's still, whether it be on the pavement or off the pavement, I still like to be able to go through the gears, even though it's just, you know, my, I've got a 2017 and it's, you know, a little V6 in it, but um, I still have fun doing that. You know, I can yeah. pull up, hit that obstacle, put it in whatever gear I want, you know, if I'm in four low or four high or just too high, depending on what, you know, what the trail is. Yeah. Is the, um, I had that option. Yep. So I like to tell drive. people if you like driving and you like having control over things, get a manual. Yeah. The, the experience is totally different. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people today's, today's crowd seem to be a little, uh, apprehensive of, of driving a manual. It scares them. Um, but once they start driving it, you know, they love them. Yeah. You know, I know, uh, you know, young women who, start driving a uh, manual and said, Oh, this is the only way I'm going to go. We just started working with the uh, Jillian Rebecca in her uh, Tacoma. She's yeah. got a 20. You know her? I, I know of her. Uh, I haven't met her in person, but I have, you know, exchanged neat, some neat. messages with her. Yes. Neat, neat person. I mean, she's, she's a funny, funny person. And I mean, funny by, she's just happy go lucky. Oh yeah. Uh, and so she's, she's an absolute joy to be around, but she w would not, she wouldn't drive an automatic. For her, no way. It's got to be a manual. <laughs> she just because yep. she likes the feel of of driving that vehicle. You know, it's it's. I don't know if it's a, a control thing that she looks at, but it's um, that's her. Yeah. You know, that's. I'm gonna do this. This is the way I like to do it. Just and we we uh, worked with Marco uh, Hernandez from yeah. uh, Overland Rocks and yeah. the Trail Recon uh, guys. So. Uh, you know, he's the same way. He says, yeah, he says, I've driven both. You know, his daughter has an auto one of his daughters has an automatic and the other one has the manual and she has the same Jeep I do. Uh, he said, but you know, he absolutely, both of them are different, but both of them love their vehicle. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just one of those things. And, and the one daughter, she just absolutely loves the manual. Yeah. Well, my oldest, as soon as she could reach the pedals, we're out on a hunting trip and I, you know, said, okay, let's. Let's go ahead and swap seats. And so here she is, nine years old, just shot her first grouse, and she had her first time driving, driving anything, and it was a manual transmission. I made it easier for her, but I had it in a four low. You couldn't, you couldn't stall the thing if you wanted to, uh, but she had that experience and kind of solidified, I think, the legacy of manual transmissions in my house. I think everybody should have learned how to drive on a manual transmission, quite oh, honestly, yeah. because you. I guess you're mo more in tune with the vehicle at that point in time. You're paying attention yeah. to the vehicle. Uh, uh, and, you know, with an automatic, it, it's just that, an automatic. And you can – people are tend to get uh, sidetracked and preoccupied with other things. With a manual transmission, yep. you're, dri you're driving this thing, you know. And, it's, and, and I don't mean to say that, like, to scare someone, like, ooh, I don't know if I can handle that, but you can. It's it just becomes second nature. Yep. It, you know, it's just you're just doing it, and uh, but you're so much more in tune to what the vehicle's been doing because you're listening, you're you're feeling. I mean, you're grabbing that gear shifter, and you can feel any vibration or anything else 
and you can feel it in your pedal. You yep. know, and you can when you're operating the the vehicle itself, it's um, it's just a totally different. You're 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 a, you're at one with that vehicle, and you're driving it. You yeah. know, so. Well, I well, really want to say thank you for coming on the show. If somebody wants to learn more about Center Force Clutches, uh, where would you have them go? Well, go to our website, obviously, uh, thecenterforce.com. You can look at some of the universities that we have there. Uh, there's some other uh, things that we have on our YouTube page as well uh, that we're just starting to grow. So we've been adding little videos here and there. And there actually is a nice little video on there about the inertia that we did with the uh, JL. Okay. Well, I'll make sure to have links to that here on the show notes uh, for this uh, episode of the 4x4 podcast. Uh, I Again, just thank you very much for this. and I always love talking cars and especially manual transmission with folks. Uh, I'll be, you know, preaching the gospel of manuals for a long time. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, I uh, just uh, want to say thanks again, and we will uh, hopefully talk to you sometime soon, maybe get out on the trails once this corona business is done. All righty, sir. Artemis Overland Hardware is a local family-run business that supplies your adventures. They have a brick-and-mortar store located in Springfield, Missouri, where you can come in, browse the huge selection of equipment. And when I say the selection is huge, I mean it's huge. Artemis Overland Hardware has a large chunk of the catalogs available from Oztent, 23-0, Ezeon, Snowmaster Fridges, Timbo Tusk, Covia, Front Runner, Alucab, iCamper, Come Up Winches, Factor 55, Crazy Beaver Tools, National Luna, Red Art, Iron Man 4x4, and Goose Gear. It's just, there's so much stuff. And this is not just a long list of reputable brands. Artemis Overland Hardware is all about building relationships. You know, they, they, Aaron and his team, they work with all of those brands personally, and they have a great relationship with all of the customers. Uh, and that's really what it's all about. And he's only able to guarantee your satisfaction uh, because he's built that relationship and that trust with those brands. So Artemis Overland Hardware is is where you need to go to grab all your overlanding goods. If you have any questions about anything that Artemis Overland carries, just don't hesitate. Give Aaron and his team a call. Check out ArtemisOverland.com and get equipped and ready for all your adventures, wherever they may take you. That's A-R-T-E-M-I-S Overland.com. Check them out and hit them up on social media to so, and say thanks for their continued partnership with the 4x4 podcast. All right, so uh, before we get to the news, let's uh, go ahead and go through the garage and see what all we got here. So, Craig, uh, last we talked, I think there was some issues with you finally got the transmission, but it, there was still some stuff wrong with it. Anything new there? Um. Now, unfortunately, uh, I emailed the company and they uh, emailed me back. Uh, please, you know, give me your phone number. And as soon as we can get back into the shop, we will uh, we'll get back in contact with you. So that's where I'm hanging right now. Jeez. What I'm pain. hoping I'm hoping that. uh Next weekend, I am going to see if the clutch I have will fit onto that shaft, and I want to see if it's too long. It looks a little bit longer, but it might be the same length, and if it is, then that means I just need to, and if my clutch will fit on there, it just might mean that all I need to do is change the bearing that's, uh, I guess, right uh, what are those? A good on the flywheel. Oh, the, like the throttle there, bearing. That or, yeah, the throw. Well, I I guess it's called a throwout bearing. I can't re- remember exactly what that little bearing is. It's it's the one that's right inside the clutch. Yeah. Uh, where the clutch plate hits the motor, yeah. there's a little bearing in there that supports the front of the transmission input shaft. So. I might, if I get lucky enough, what's interesting is, is I looked at it and took a picture. That hole is big enough to put a different bearing in that's a Hmm. little bit bigger. So I'm going to try to look at it next weekend. I have my buddy, uh, Dave, uh, I'm going to ask him to, uh, try to shoot out on next Saturday because he's, he, he lives about an hour and a half away 
if he could come out and look at it and see what we can do, if we can just use that transmission or not. So I don't have to sit there and play with these guys anymore. Cause I'm, yeah, I am, uh, ready to go the other day or Friday, this last Friday, uh, I was out in the, the Tracy area and, uh, on my way back to the warehouse, uh, from work cruising along and i see rvs <laughs> with uh no Loaded rvs with crawlers with, on the back with crawlers on the back and oh, oh god yeah. i was just like and one went by and i went oh wow wait a minute i think that's my friend's truck and it looked like his jeep on the trailer but the thing was is it was a double trailer and i know he doesn't have a double trailer yeah. but i was like okay i haven't seen him in a couple of months so, yeah. so maybe he bought a double trailer because yeah. I I remember there you there was a red Jeep that he said he was gonna buy for his son. So I was thinking, well, it's Father's Day weekend. We usually do the cleanup up at the Rub uh, the Rubicon Trail that the club uh, supports. They go up and do the cleanup this weekend, the Father's Day weekend. So I was thinking about, oh wait, you know what? So I called him. I said, "Hey, are you headed? Are you headed to the Rubicon?" And he goes, "No, damn it, front end's still off the Jeep." I'm like, "Oh, okay, good. I didn't miss out." <laughs> but I'm trying to get mine together so I can get these guys, my my club, to uh, get up to the Rubicon. And so that date, I will make sure you know about, Dan. Yeah. So that's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of sitting at home. I'm still on lockdown, so I can't really go anywhere yet. Uh, but you know, the Rubicon trails is a Rubicon trail is square in the crosshairs of what I'm trying to get to. So, um, I, I think I think my Jeep is pretty much ready. I, I still need to make some adjustments on how I can carry cargo now that I've kind of chewed up some backroom space. Uh, a hope- very high rear rack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got the roof rack, so I just need some boxes to put yeah. up there. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, uh, is yeah. is Rubicon Trail really kind of the closest place for you to go off roading? For me, no. I was no, saying. I could go. The closest place would be probably Hollister, or uh, oh, I can't remember the name. Actually, the closest one I can't remember the name of it. It's uh, it's right on the hills over here. Um, we went up there one year uh, to play around, and it was just one of those where, okay, we wanted to go play. We said, oh, we'll go here. We got there, and the place was, you know, to, was supposed to be closed. It says, okay, if it's raining, you're not allowed to be in there. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah we went in there. <laughs> yeah and then the, we got busted by the park rangers and he goes look because i really don't want to have a hassle just put money in the tip the because it was one of the, it's one of the trails that uh at the trailhead they yeah. actually have a donation box sure to keep the trail open so he's like just make sure you guys put money in the trail box and then you know we're like paid okay, no problem yeah. i think when we left that box had like at least 500 bucks in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we were well, that's cool. All right. So, uh, Rich, uh, I don't know. Did we talk about your uh, fender bender on the last episode? I can't. No, because I happened. don't remember it. No, that happened okay. uh, recently. It only happened about two weeks ago, I think. And it was nothing major at all. So, yeah, some lady apparently couldn't see my really – Big bright red <laughs> truck that was parked at the gas station. <laughs> I could see that it would. I I could see how that's a problem when your eyes are closed and you're driving around. Because <laughs> that's about what it would take. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm parked. I'm you know I'm leaning up against my truck, you know, filling up the tank, and all of a sudden the whole truck just kind of shifts on me. So I stop up and I run around, walk around. I even take my I take my time. I walk around the other side of the truck, and uh, there's this lady and she's pulling through this huge space that manages to hit the right rear quarter panel of the truck bed. <laughs> wow. 
you know. And one, she's like, uh, you know, it, it was just a small amount of damage, real, real small amount of damage. And I was just going to say, you know, never mind, don't worry about it, whatever. But then it hit me. She was planning on just driving off. <laughs> oh, yeah. That ain't going to work. So, yeah. So I was like, well, you know, of course I'm going to file this claim. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So you want to talk about all the new parts I'm getting for my truck? <laughs> yeah. I see the list here on the show notes. Uh, this is exciting. So, yeah, I ordered a, uh, a decked drawer system. Nice. I was going to build my own, but it's like, you know what? Deck already has this awesome setup out there, um, you know, and it already supports all the weight you want, all that good stuff. Why not go that route? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got a deck system coming. Um, ordered an ARB fridge. I was going to go with the Dometic, but uh, this year, was it this year or late last year, Dometic changed the way they did all their fridges. Oh really? They now, yeah, they now make their own compressors in house. Uh, they don't use that tried and true compressor that they've used forever. Uh-huh. And uh, just getting on the forums, I've been reading all kinds of issues with them. That and pretty much everything they've got is on back order right now. Oh yeah, well that's not so. Work. Yeah. Um, so I went with an ARB just cause I'm familiar with ARB. I've known lots of people that have them and it's really kind of a tried and true fridge. Yeah. So, you know, I ordered a 50 quart ARB fridge. Um, let's see what else did I get? Oh, I got a Renergy 200 watt, uh, portable solar panel. So I thought about mounting panels on top of the truck, right? On top, on top of the cap, the yep. truck cap. And the more I think about it, it's like, you know, that doesn't really make sense. Your truck is not always parked in the sun. It's not always angled at the direction of the sun. Portable panels just really make more sense. It seems like you're going to get way more use out of them. They're going to be more efficient if you're able to turn them in the direction of the sun and where it's at. Yeah. So I got a 200-watt Renergy portable solar panel set uh, coming as well. Did you order that right from uh, Renergy? No, I actually ordered all of them off of Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I got a I got the small Jackery coming also. Nice. Just kind of play with it and see what I can do. I mean, it's not going to be enough to run like. Well, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what how many watts the uh, the fridge pulls. I mean, it could certainly support it for a little bit, I think. But yeah. Um. But like I said, I've got the Renergy Solar set up, so I don't really need the Jackery for that if I have an issue. So so does that solar panel kit have like the charge controllers and everything already built in? It does. It's got waterproof controllers already built into it. Uh, it comes with basically a set of uh, battery terminals. You just plug them right into the battery or truck. I'll probably um, get a different setup for that. Um, and more like a uh, the SAE style plug. Yeah. Like, like I don't know if we've been shopping for RVs lately, and a lot of them are solar ready, and they've got a lo- outlet on the outside of them. And I find that outlet is kind of universal. I think the Jackery even has one on the side of it. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. But I'll probably wire that plug into it. That way I can plug right into the RV, too, when we get one. So Nice. Uh, so... What are you kind of looking at in terms of RV? Like, a, I guess just a bumper pull, not a. Yeah, no, we're going to. No, we're going to do. We've kind of narrowed it down. We're going to do uh, a travel trailer. Um, we've looked at a ton of travel trailers. Went out and looked at the Black Series. Uh, that's the Australian design one made in China that's recently come over to the U.S. over the last couple of years. Um, I think we've narrowed it down to uh, two. Uh, it's um, Outdoors RV. They're made out of Oregon and Northwood RV. I think they're also made in Oregon. Uh, but they're true four-season travel trailers, and uh, they're pretty robust. Like I'm not going to take them off any rock crawling trails, but they could certainly handle fire roads and stuff yeah. like that. They're more robust than your 
typical travel trailer. Sure. What manufacturer is it? Outdoors RV and Northwood. Okay, those. Okay, that sounds yeah. more like a dealer, not the actual name nope. of the trailer no, itself. The, yeah, no. So uh, Outdoors RV, they make several called the Creekside and the Timber Ridge. Uh, Northwood makes one that you see a lot, like the Arctic Box, the Desert Box, um, and the Nash. Those are you see those everywhere it seems. Yeah. Okay. So are you going for an inside sleeper with uh with uh rooftop tent or a rooftop tent fit the whole family? No, this would be a travel trailer, so it, I, there's no pop ups, there's no it's not a ah, hybrid okay. like it has the pop up, so no, it's everything. Yeah. They can, it's simple. You open the door, you walk inside and get in bed, you, cook dinner, whatever. That's right. <laughs> You have a shower, you have a toilet, you have a king size bed. Yep. <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah. I like it. No, it didn't make sense. Since we're going to be living in this full time when we're doing travel nursing, it didn't, it didn't make sense to go the truck camper route. You know, yeah. I, I really want to put a truck camper on the back of the truck with a flatbed. But it just doesn't make sense that, you know, the bumper pull travel trailer just makes more sense. Yeah, because yeah. it's most, so much easier to just, one, well, you don't need it, disconnect it, boom. Right. You know, yeah. late night, yeah. late night, you got to get to work the next morning. <laughs> you just put and you get home late. You just pull in the driveway, unhook it. Okay, now I go to right. work. I don't have to lug this thing until next weekend yeah. yep. where I well, have a whole day to get it off the back of my truck. And there's no guarantees that my wife will end up working the same shifts as me, too. So, you know, there's no reason to wake her up so that she can drive me to work, drive back to wherever we're camped so that she can go back to bed. So this way, I've still got the truck to get to and from work and all that good stuff. Well, that's exciting. Sounds like you've got a lot of cool stuff coming. Uh, I'm I'm sure you're going to be super happy with that deck system. I haven't heard a single negative comment from anybody yeah so, likewise that's awesome you have to send us a link of those uh websites of those rv so or so we can take a look at them yeah we'll, i will we'll put them in the show notes here uh so i guess for for those listening just go to the four by four podcast.com slash 158 and that'll take you to the show notes where you'll find all the links for the stuff that we're talking about here well, uh, you know, it has been a couple of weeks since we talked last, and I, I had a long list of things here that I had planned to do in the show notes, uh, but I've actually got them done now. Uh, so <laughs> the uh, Iron Man 4x4 America winch is installed. It's the 9,500-pound synthetic line winch. Um, it was a little bit of a chore to get it in there because my bumper hasn't been removed. We talked about that, I think, the last episode. Yeah. Yeah, the the mile marker winch did not want to let go, uh, so I had to do some <laughs> some you know I, I brought out the death wheel and ground off some bolts uh, to get those things out of there. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't use the fire wrench. No, no, I tried <laughs> I try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, but you know I wasn't too worried about it because you know I scuffed up the uh, the mounting face for the. Uh, the rollers, the roller fair leads. And, you know, I had planned on putting on the, uh, the Haas fair lead that, that came with the Iron Man four by four winch. Um, but then come to find out the way the ARB bumper is set up, uh, the window for where the winch cable comes out isn't compatible with the Haas fair lead. Uh, so I would have to get a offset, um, fair lead. But then when I kind of pulled the smart people on Facebook, uh, some of the experts, uh, like Jonathan Hansen, I, you know, he's well known in the off-roading community. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, uh, you might want to look him up. He's a one of the four-wheel drive trainers and very involved in the Overland Expo type of business. There, anyways, um, he recommended going with the roller fair leads, and you know, the the myth of being able of rollers pinching a a synthetic line totally debunked it's not a thing uh so that's what i ended up going with uh i just replaced the rollers with the daystar polyurethane ones a um, little easier on synthetic line um, it's not gonna wear as the line and scuff it up as bad as a 
you know, a metal line, if it got any corrosion on it, um, seeing as how I'll be, you know, driving this around long distances and you know, that's a possibility. So the Daystar polyurethane ones, um, I haven't really done a hard pull or anything. All I've done is, you know, pre-spool and pre-tension the line inside there. But, but that's done. Um, I've mounted a pair of the 5x7 lights from Iron Man 4x4 and did some running around in the desert. And those things are wicked bright. Like, super, super bright. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I kind of it went out on... There's lots of dark, desolate highways out here. Very desolate. So I was able to stop in, in the middle of the road. Not the highway, just the road. Uh, and when I measured off how far I could see, like I kind of picked a spot, uh, like a sign or a rock on the side of the road. And then I drove the distance to that rock and it was dang close to a half mile. Like just, that's impressive. (laughs) Those things are amazing. Um, and the other thing that I really like about these lights is that, on the edge, uh, on the both the left and right side of the lights, uh, there's a reflector that kind of pushes the light out to the sides. Uh, so you get a really wide beam pattern, and, and that's really the... I think we talked about this with uh, Baja Designs uh, lights, is that's what makes you comfortable. When you've got those lights on, you're not just driving down a tunnel of light. You can actually see what's around to your side. Uh, and these lights do those do that really well. Uh, I do have another pair of the lights and I've got a mounting bracket that I made. Um, now that I'm getting fairly proficient with the welder, uh, I, I made some, some brackets. So I'll put those up on the roof rack and, uh, just aim them a little bit differently than the ones on the bumpers. Uh, so we've got a really good, um, spread on the lights, you know, in, in the event that I need to see into the future. Cause that's about <laughs> now, Dan, have you ever had, lights on top of a vehicle yeah i i have um and these it's not just throwing light all all over the place uh there's still a beam pattern to it so i i don't anticipate i'm going to get a lot of hood glare um and i've got a a matte uh finish on the hood so i'm not going to get a bunch of light you know kind of reflecting off like that um, but I've had because no, that's what that's uh, I had my uh, my little uh, Dodge Ram Dodge 50 yeah. and I had put uh, some KC lights on the top of that. And then the first time I put them on, I'm like, hey, OK, and then went and then I went, damn, I can't see because the way I had set them. Yeah. Was <clears throat> the light actually reflected right down the window windshield. Oh, geez. And onto the hood. And because I had them too far forward. Um, and then some people say, well, you got to mount them way farther forward. So they're beyond, you know, right at the top of the windshield, but I couldn't because of the way that the, the thing was shaped. So I pushed them all Mm. the way back. So the roof actually acted like, and, uh, uh, I, I just did it one night. I was it. my bar was, uh, movable so I could slide the bar back and forth. So what I did is I turned them on and I just kept sliding the bar back slowly, 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 slowly until the the roof actually cleared the hood with the shadow. So then I didn't have that issue. And I had a night and then I realized, oh, OK, well, now I have a nice light out the sides, too, because yeah. I had light so far back. So, yep. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do some yeah, playing around old, with some, my I old can... YJ. Yeah. Yeah. My old YJ back in the 90s, I had a set of. Uh, the old KC Daylighters. Yeah. I had those mounted on my A-pillars, but up towards the top. And it was the same thing. There was so much glare. I I hated using those things. In fact, they usually just kept the covers on them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so these are going to be switched differently than the ones on the bumpers. So those are going to be the, you know, special use only, you know, having them up there that high. But uh, I know they're going to throw out some some serious light. So uh, I've got those ready to install. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe sometime during this week I'll get them wired up. But uh, I actually got out and did some off-roading today. So, you know, I that's the nice thing about living where I do is that off-roading opportunities are very easy to get to. Um, there's 
you know, open desert on, on posts that I can go explore. Um, some of it is only available during the daytime. Some of it you can use whenever. Uh, but there's also Calico just down the road. And, uh, and I'll talk about this more, but I, I've, I've been trying out the Onyx app, uh, off-road app. I was, yeah. I was just going to back. I was just going to, I was just going to comment and ask you about that. that yeah. App. What, what do you think of it? Cause I'm, I'm up in the air. I don't want another account. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, it's I, asking I get that. for an account and I'm like, okay. So I'm like, Oh, do I really have to do account? And then I figured out that you don't have to make an account. Oh yeah. So, um, well, I do it, because I've been able i I've, I've been able to get it to work without half to putting in an account. Okay. So, it's still a good app. People will look because it immediately comes up when you get it. Oh, sign up! I think it's yeah. more of what is, and it's really getting annoying because it links to your email, and <laughs> I get freaking three emails a day. I'm like, I got tired huh. of this. I went in and. I guess because I haven't signed up. Yeah, but, I don't know. I'm still, I'm, I'm still using it. Well, so I, I've, I didn't have that. Problem. I've downloaded it, but I haven't had a chance to really play with it yet. Um, I mean, it looks interesting. Is it 100% free, or is there? No. So I've got the the paid service. It's a uh, thirty dollars for a year. So okay, so that, similar to Gaia. Yeah, I think Gaia is like forty or forty five. Um, and that's really the direct competitor to Onyx, uh, the off-road app. Um, but I love the... So what is Onyx giving you that guy is not? So it's it's extremely simple to use. Uh, like the the just navigating the app uh, is very easy. The online side, on the desktop side, you can do a lot, uh, like importing all the routes. Um, that's one of the things that kind of frustrates me right now, but... Like they are updating the service and the pretty quick, uh, so I know that's something that's still in development. Being able to right. import all my old GPX files from you know all the other mapping apps that I've used, but you know when you open it up, uh, just like the hunting map, it'll show you the different types of property, uh, whether it's BLM or private land, or um, you know I see a lot of DO. Department of Defense land around me, um, so I can easily navigate around knowing whose property I'm on. Um, and like the hunting one, you can actually see the private ones, and it'll give you the contact information for the owner, um, which is pretty handy. So does the $30 include the hunting one also? Uh, I don't know. I haven't really opened up the hunting one since I started using the off-road map. Yeah. But uh, as you kind of like scroll around on the map, it'll pop up. You'll see when there's a off-roading trail uh, and it highlights it there. And you, when you click on it, uh, it'll tell you a little bit of information about the, the trail itself. So I went out today uh, in Calico, like I said, and started the... Uh, for those that are familiar with the area, the Odessa Doran Loop. Uh, and this is a 6 out of 10 trail. And I would say it's every bit of a 6 out of 10 right now. There's been quite a few areas dug out. Uh, add that with the fact that it's, you know, over 100 degrees. You know, probably shouldn't have been out there in the middle of the day anyways. Um, but we got, uh, let's see, it's a 6-mile loop. And we did... Let's see, three and a half miles, uh, came to a fairly steep waterfall and I kind of looked back and the kids and they're all red faced, uh, hot. I said, okay, we'll pack it in here and, and turn around. And just before we got to that obstacle, I came across a, another guy in a Jeep Cherokee, very well built. Uh, he was on 35s as well and he, he was coming the other way. Uh, so we stopped, talked for a little bit. And I went and he followed me just to make sure we were going to clear these obstacles because uh, he's been out here a number of times. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, we said, all right, that's it. We'll just we'll just head out. And on the way back out, he snapped three bolts, all the ivory bolt off the steering box. <laughs> uh, 
So it was one of those things like he was doing a good thing trying to help us out. And as we were coming back, oh, like, man. Yeah, all right, man, <laughs> let me try to help you out. <laughs> So, you know, we exchanged phone numbers and I took off back to the house to see if my random box of bolts had exactly what he needed. I said, hey, if you get this sorted out before I get back, just shoot me a text. Um, and he had a friend who was over nearby to campground and just happened to have the bolts. So they got it all taken care of before we came back out. Um, but it was just interesting to cross paths with somebody like that. And it's kind of goes back to what we've talked about so many times. The off-roading community is is different than so many other communities where, you know, everybody's looking out for each other. So, yeah. Okay, I just tried to use the app again. Now it's locked me out. Oh, it boy. says I got to pay the money or to use it. <laughs> yeah, so, you messed it up. I, yeah, I don't know. I, Great. I ruined spoke it for too, everybody, Craig. I spoke too soon. <laughs> so here's the other <laughs> cool thing. Uh, when you open up the app... Uh, over on the far left-hand side across the bottom, it's got uh, a button that says rides. And so you pick the type of vehicle that you have, uh, whether it's a dirt bike, a ATV, uh, or a high clearance 4x4, four, four four, or a full width road. Uh, so I, I've got selected the high clearance 4x4 four four and full width roads. And so it's only going to show me the trails that it thinks are suitable for those types of, types of vehicles. Um, it doesn't yeah. know me. It doesn't know what I do. <laughs> yeah, well, here, no, but it knows what's you also, allowed. <laughs> you, you also forgot that it also shows uh, the uh, the overland kind of vehicle trails too. Yeah, that falls into the high clearance. Uh, and my Jeep was not in overlanding mode; it was on full on off road mode. <laughs> Was the Jeep in that mode or was the driver in that mode? A uh, little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I, I removed the trailer hitch off the Jeep so I could clear some of these um, steeper embankments. You know, and it when we first got out there, I was airing down my tires. And there was a guy in a Toyota Tacoma lifted and everything. He drove up, uh, didn't stop to say hello or anything. I guess he's the Toyota guy that doesn't think Jeeps can, can hang or whatever. So he just drove right on past and he didn't make it even a half mile into the trail before he realized this was, he was in over his head. Uh, so he, we made sure he was able to back up and get turned around and said, all right, well, see you later. Um, and didn't see him again. <laughs> he, he was gone. Um, but there's some fairly rough stuff in there. It was great. I haven't been out like doing some hard rock crawling in a very long time, and it felt pretty good. Uh, it was refreshing to see the Jeep working as well as it did, you know. And so I, you know, I failed to mention the Hellwig sway bar. Uh, I've got that installed now, but I disconnected it before we hit the trail, and I didn't realize how well that sway bar was working until I got back on the road when I was trying to hurry and get back and get those bolts. I didn't even hook a, the sway bar back up. Holy crap. Like I had, it's one of those things like you don't realize how bad it is until you, you know, have a sway bar and then you go right back to not having it. Like, okay, yep. This sway bar is doing a lot. It makes a huge difference <laughs> when you're running at highway speeds. Uh, so uh, that, that, I will not be punching Mike Hallmark in the face like he challenged me to do. <laughs> uh, for those that haven't heard that interview, you got to go back, catch that episode with uh, Mike from uh, Hell Week. So that one, that one's really good. Uh, I may try mo adjusting the sway bar links to the bolt holes where it really tightens up this, just the, the ride, um, just to see how the difference is. Um, but for sure, uh, I don't know. Now that I've got it, I don't know how it went for for all these years without having a sway bar on the Jeep. So uh, for those of you that don't have sway bars and you just, you know, pucker every time you go around a corner, uh, you might want to check out Hellwig. <laughs> <laughs> it really works well. Uh, so lots going on with the Jeep. Oh, this is the first time we went out with the, the third row seat in the Jeep. Gave that a try. I got the, the Y harness in there. And uh, everything worked great. I mean, I, I probably this was the this is the seat I gave you back like what ten years ago. All those years ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> we've read many books with the kids sitting on that, just using it as a uh, one of the coolest couches in the house, I'll say. But now it's actually functioning as a Jeep seat again. <laughs> now it's a really cool seat. Yeah. A seat of ooze. Yep. We totally got off our show notes. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> totally derailed which is fine we can you know skip these articles if we want to the one i the one i have to talk about is the the only one i I thought had any real merit was 600 what was it 650 percent rv bookings went up yeah well (laughs) this year Oh my God. I totally see it. I mean, I have, I've only gotten off this desert Island uh, a few times, but every time I have seen rental RVs running up and down the road. So to back up what Craig's talking about is uh, an article from the auto blog. And it's saying that RV rentals are up 650%. And that's a lot because RV rentals are pretty popular already. Um, So this is, that's an astronomical growth. And this is all being attributed to the COVID-19 where nobody wants to fly for their vacations. Uh, They instead are, are driving. And and nobody wants to stay in hotels and yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And in restaurants are kind of wonky with their hours or you can't eat inside Uh, all the headaches that come with that. I'd be kind of curious what RV sales are going to do too. Oh yeah. I'm sure they're way up as well. So this one's yeah. really cool. Uh, I, I think- so yeah, I expect to see your local campgrounds just inundated with RVs this summer. Yeah. Well, here's the hard part. It's a lot of RVs and our, our, our RV parks. They only have a mi- so many spaces. So then it's going to get, okay, <laughs> well, getting reservation. Like you got to make sure. Now, before, you could be able to just get on the road, drive, Come a, and when you get to wherever you decide, oh, okay, well, you know, this is kind of the area I'd like to stop in and check out. You could usually go yeah. into an RV park and just, hey, I need a space for the night or a week, and then and they just sign up. Now you're going to need reservations. There's no way I could go to, you know, uh, Las Vegas at, with right. an RV right now, or you know, up to Moab yeah. or you know any of those places. I mean, out like where, you know, uh, Johnson Valley, where it's all open. I mean, as long as the military ain't doing their maneuvers, you can just drive out there, find a place, park, and yeah. you're good. But I mean, it's gonna better have stuff. one with a generator. It's <laughs> everywhere, screwed. though. I mean, like even even South Dakota, like up around Mount Rushmore, there's some great wheeling up there, you know. But yeah, that. Those RV parks up there are going to be packed. Well, and it's going to be interesting to see because a lot of these RVs are not necessarily designed for boondocking for multiple days, uh, where you you don't have the amenities that you find in an RV park. And I don't think that's what most of these people are going to be doing with it. I think most of them are going to be trying to get into yeah. RV parks where they can plug in and get you know instant hook up to the water and and all that good stuff. I don't think a lot of them are going to be boondocking, or if they think that's an option, they're going to be you know, surprised. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, Yeah. you, if you've, if you've used an RV, I've used one. I used one when we, uh, I went to uh, King of the Hammers that one year. I, and I made sure that the RV I had had a generator because I knew there wasn't going to be no paddle and water out there. And I almost ran that thing dry because I was like, I kept using it, using it, use it. And I kept looking at the, the gas gauge. I'm like, oh, okay, this isn't, you know, this, it's really the generator's not using that much fuel. Then when I went to leave, I went, oh, t- <laughs> <laughs> I that generator used a lot more fuel than I thought it did, and I almost didn't make it to the gas station. Oh, geez. And uh, <laughs> and then I filled it up. It's like, ooh, okay, I learned my lesson. I need to figure out something else to either make sure I have enough fuel um, because it it's really weird if you didn't I, I kept turning the ignition on uh, on the on the RV to see the fuel and yeah. it wasn't 
But then I didn't realize that you actually needed to fire up the RV to get the gauge to register to get properly. A good Jeez. Yeah. I, I didn't, first time I ever had an RV. I didn't, I didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> now I know. Yep. There's probably a lot of people that are learning a lot about how to run an RV now, especially with these rentals being up. So, uh, well, let's, uh, go ahead and skip over all these news bits, uh, None of them are super exciting anyways. Uh, we can go to the gear review. So one of the things that I uh, did a lot of, I, I replaced three different U-joints. as just regular routine ma- maintenance. Um, I noticed, you know, my draft shaft was starting to sound like a flock of seagulls was chasing me. So I knew that I needed to replace <laughs> that U-joint. Um, and, you know, I've replaced a lot of U-joints. That's one of those things like as soon as I replace one, I go ahead and buy another one just to keep in my tool chest uh, and in the the bag whenever I go because I see that as kind of the fuse and the weak link in the drive train. So if something's going to snap, it's a U-joint that's fairly easy to replace on the trail. And, you know, I like I said, I do a lot of preventive maintenance, so I don't have to worry about breaking stuff on the trail. Uh, But this is one of those times, like, I just could not get everything to line up the right way. And I think it's because the two of the U joints that I replaced were part of the, the double carton joint and there's an extra spring in there and it puts tension in a different way. And it's just not as easy to get all lined back up. Uh, so I finally broke down and I ordered a heavy duty ball joint press and U joint tool. Uh, and I don't know why I didn't order this thing 20 years ago. Like this thing is amazing because they didn't, they didn't build it 20 years ago. Well, <laughs> it wasn't on the market have. 20 years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably something similar to it, but not this particular one. Yeah. So this is 58, 59 bucks. So less than $60. And it's essentially a giant C clamp, uh, that has one end, uh, is large enough to fit over the, the cap of a U joint. So you just crank down the press and it, pushes the U-joint until the cap pops off, and then you just, you know, slide it out of the way, and you're done. Like, it's just that easy. Uh, It says not to use an impact wrench, which, that's fine. Uh, You can just put a breaker bar on there, you know, a socket, and keep cranking until that U-joint cap pops off. And this is, this is brilliant. Uh, I, if, if you are into off-roading, and you have ever replaced a U-joint, you've got to get one of these. Uh, And there's a bunch of them out there. There's more expensive ones, uh, you know, but for as often as I change these, like this is something that's going to stay in my, in my toolbox, uh, tool bag. It's a little big to go in a tool bag, uh, but it'll go next to my tool bag anyways. Uh, So man, have to have to build a little special compartment in the, under the third row seat for it. Uh, Yeah. So, I don't know that it's going to fit in there. So I, I am kind of in the market for some some sort of cargo box to put on my roof rack. I don't necessarily want to have a bunch of weight up on the roof rack. However, I think it's kind of unavoidable. If I want to have the kids and the whole family riding in the Jeep comfortably, like I, I just conceded, I gave up that cargo space, and I'm going to have to put a bunch of crap up on the roof rack. Uh, so um, Don't you have a trailer? Yeah, so I'm not taking that trailer on the Rubicon Trail. And like I said, that's... Why not? Dead it's built. No, it, I'm not... be perfect for it. I am not dragging that thing across the Rubicon Trail. Uh, I, that's how you become a meme. <laughs> that's how you become an off-road yep. meme. Not going to do it. Uh, I would, <laughs> well, you'll, you'll need it. At least you'll need it on the back of the Jeep when you get up there because you're going to need a place to crash out. Because if we do... If I'm lucky yeah. enough to get the guys together and we do our thing, there's a place where we go and camp. And so we camp at one spot and we leave everything there, then go wheeling and then come back to that spot. Yeah. And so that's the other thing. Like I, it's a like a nine hour drive or something to get maybe seven hours. No, I think. Anyways, it's a long friggin' drive to get from where I'm at up to the Rubicon trail. So I figure that's, I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'm going to have a long break, take a couple days so we can split it up, do some enjoyable stuff on the way up to the Rubicon. And then 
if we have to park the trailer up there uh, in a parking lot and then just regular ground tent for a night or two on the Rubicon Trail, however long it ends up taking, uh, and then circle back around to the, the trailer with the tent, we'll do that. Um, but I'm not taking that trailer on the Rubicon Trail. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't ever. Yeah, I don't. God, that just starts the whole dragging a trailer debate down trails. I, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never see me doing it. <laughs> yeah, because the second you do, that really complicates backing up. And if you're trying to rock crawl technical obstacles with a trailer, like, yeah. it just doesn't well, end well. Maybe these people just don't make as many mistakes as I do, but I turn around a lot on trail. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also got to remember a um, couple years back that uh, the because the Rubicon Trail is actually a state road, yeah, it's not considered a trail; it's a road. Um, they mandatory that you have to be able to do, or the trail has to be accessible for vehicles with only 35 inch tires or 33 inch tires. I was going to say 33, I think. Yeah. Yeah, 33. Yep. So the big, hard, nasty obstacles aren't there anymore and they're keeping it. So a, a Cherokee on 33s can get through there. And it's a nice drive, but it's not as technical as it used to be. A lot of people are upset about that, but I mean, would you rather not have the yeah. road or the trail to run? Or if that's okay, now that's it's too damn easy. If that's the concession it took to keep it open, uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But then, then you can. You know, if you want to just run the Rubicon Trail because it's an iconic trail, you run it. And then if you want something more technical, you go to Fordyce. Yeah. Yeah. And that's. You know, I need to check and see what uh, the Rubicon Trail is rated on uh, on X Maps. I won't do it now because I will completely derail my Well, it looks like you're doing it now. <laughs> The temptation is strong. It's so easy to find all these trails. The problem is, like, there's so many to choose from. So, oh yeah, I will avoid that. Uh, so I oh, will. You add, should come to Kansas. Oh yeah, maybe I should scroll over here while I'm scrolling around on the map uh, where I shouldn't be. Told you, you can put his phone down. It's dangerous. But uh, so I have. I've been joined as a uh, an affiliate and a trail guide, trail team, whatever. I don't know what they call it with Onyx Maps. Uh, so if if somebody is interested in trying out the paid service uh, for Onyx Maps, just go to the four x four podcast dot com slash o n x for Onyx, obviously, uh, and and they'll know that you heard about it from the four x four podcast. And you know, I'm not just saying that because. Um, we make a couple dollars off of it, uh, but we, I do appreciate that. Uh, but I really do think this is a really great app. Uh, and it's the ability to get offline maps, uh, upload your own stuff, save your routes, share it with friends, add pictures along the routes, uh, mark waypoints and everything. It, it's really good. It's a really good app. And for only 30 bucks, like you cannot beat it. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm 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 debating on it. Uh, you know, I got the i, you know, my iPad. I'm just wondering if I can just just do my iPad with it and try it out on there. And Ooh, I bet it's really. But good it doesn't on have to be on a big screen. Well, my uh, my Gaia membership has expired, so maybe I'll just re- you know go with Onyx. You know, this is kind of an interesting topic since you're talking about doing it on iPad. Um, I saw. Uh, Oh, God. What's the name of the YouTube channel now? I can't think of it now. But he's running an Alpine system in his uh, Forerunner, and he's able to run Gaia GPS using CarPlay Is that the, right on his stock car stereo. The Lifestyle Overland? Yes. The, yep. The family? Yep. I, I've I've seen that. I haven't looked too closely at the the stuff they had about that particular head unit because I've got a single den in my Jeep. And I'm not about oh. to try and rip out the head unit on that Ram truck 
it's connected to way too many things. Well, that's just it. I think this Alpine unit actually fits a single den. Oh, what? Or Alpine has has a radio that does all these same features that fits a single den unit. Yeah. Man, I'm perfectly happy with my $30 Walmart special that has Bluetooth input. Like here yeah. I am in the 20th century. <laughs> if somebody rips it out, I'll spend another okay. 30 bucks and get another one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I've been playing with the app, you know, just looking at the, you know, the way it, you know, how it looks. Yeah. I and then I blame me. I'm tilted the app. It. I tilted it sideways and it takes up the whole. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty <laughs> My awesome. My whole iPad here. So uh, I didn't see many uh, trails around you, Rich. Sorry. Turns out no, not I, a lot I, of off I could have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> I could have told you that. <laughs> uh, but you know, there are some things, uh, let's see, there are some trails that I see, or at least I take it back. These aren't necessarily trails, but this is content that other people have uploaded, whether it's running trails, yeah. bike trails, there, there is a lot of stuff there. Um, but you're out of the dual sport game from what I remember. Yep. There's a Rubicon trail. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've gone the exact so opposite here, of dual sport. Since now. we're talking about this, this tr- this show is going completely off the rails. Click on oh, that completely. one. I I'm curious. What did they what did they rate the Rubicon Trail on there? It won't give me unless I oh, pay up. Dead gummit. Well, <laughs> I'll look it up later. If only we had somebody on this that has paid for the membership. Yeah, well, <laughs> damn. I should have thought more forward. I was too excited just about using the uh uh using it for the trails that I did. Oh, never mind, I already found it. Well, see now it's how now let's say now what um they're given a little promotional where we're we promoted the app a little bit for them. Now, let's say I want to pay for it through the app. How do they know that I heard about it on the 4x4 podcast if I just download it and push the buy it now button? That's a great question. I have no idea. But I, I if you're going to try it out and you want to support the show, and if you just want to try it out and not support the show, that's fine. I, I will never know the difference unless you tell me. Um, just go to the 4x4podcast.com slash ONX, and it'll just walk you through the process and through the – Miracle of internet cookies, they will know. And if we get nothing from it, that's still cool um, because I hope you find a it, – it's super useful. So I I love that you can just scroll around, discover new trails, and plan your adventures. This has been my, my pastime. Whenever I get tired of scrolling on Instagram, I scroll around on the, the map and be like, oh, this is a cool trail. I need to save that one. Check it out. So – Anyways, that's enough of me messing around with the phone. <laughs> I feel like we should be calling this the Onyx X show. Oh, maybe maybe we will. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, Anyways, it hasn't been downloaded yet, so. We have a little, some feedback. Uh, let's see here. Oh, man. Great. We haven't had those in a while. I love hearing those. I love being torn about. I should have. I screw up. Made this bigger. I. <laughs> This is a tiny little picture. I've got pretty. Need my reading glasses? I might. I feel like I'm about Here's to play. My reading glasses. I'm playing here, trombone with the uh, laptop here. This is from Bama Country Boy, uh, and he says, "Always enjoy when a new one drops." Have listened to most of the past episodes, which is there. There's a lot of the past episodes, so thank you very much, there, uh, Bama Country Boy. And we've got another one. The King Joshua says, it's hard to find a good off-road podcast that has guys with some experience yet are down to earth and enjoyable to listen to. This one checks the boxes. So thanks for those. Um, And for anybody who sends us a review or sends a review, whether it's on iTunes or Facebook or all, whatever the places are, um, just let us know. And, or if we read it on the show and you hear your, uh, your not call sign, uh, comment screen name <laughs> whatever they're called if you hear your name just shoot us an email uh, the 4x4 podcast to yahoo.com with your address or, or 
whatever the messaging is that you want to use, uh, and we'll send out a sticker to you. So that is that. Uh, I do want to remind you that we are proud members of the 4x4 Radio Network. Uh, just head over to 4x4radio.com, and you'll find all the other shows on the network. Uh, we got Center Steer Podcast, talking Land Rovers, on uh, the Jeep Shock Show, talking all things Jeep, Trail Chasers, and On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. So be sure to check those out. I was over, I uh, was a guest on the Jeep Talk Show lately. It was easier than trying to get a whole show produced. I just got to join on there and just harass Tony. <laughs> it was a good time. I, I I remember going on there one time and harassing me. That was fun too. Yeah. Uh, I want to say thank you again to Artemis Overland Hardware for helping this show continue. Be sure to check them out. Artemis Overland Hardware on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, ArtemisOverland.com. Uh, and their new showroom space there in Springfield, Missouri, you know, it is outstanding. Uh, I can't wait to get a chance to go and, and see them in person. It's just a long haul from Southern California. Uh, if you have any feedback for today's show, you can send us to send it to us on email, the 4 by 4 podcast at yahoo.com. On Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, it is at the 4 by 4 podcast there. Or a voicemail, you can send us a voicemail or a text. 719-924-5337 and here on the show notes the 4x4podcast.com slash 158 there will be a little link to the speak pipe I think is the service that we use and it allows you to send a really high quality voicemail ser- voice message uh, but you can uh, you know record a voice memo whatever on your phone and send that to us and we'll play that here on the show uh, answer some of your questions it's been a while since we got any questions uh, but I think we got some pretty good answers. But anyways, that's it. Get this show back on the trail. Uh, it's time to hit the trails. So tread lightly. God bless and stay safe while exploring your world. Your world.